Hey friends, this is Scott. I want you to know how much I appreciate you as listeners, and I hope you appreciate my sponsors because they make this show possible. Raygun provides full-stack error, crash, and performance monitoring for tech teams. Whether you're a software engineer looking to diagnose and resolve issues with greater speed and accuracy, or a product manager drowning in bug reports, or maybe you're just concerned you're losing customers to poor quality online experiences, Raygun can provide you with the answers. Get full-stack error and performance monitoring in one place. The next time you're struggling to replicate errors and performance issues in your code base, think Raygun. Head over to raygun.com, that's R-A-Y-G-U-N.com, and get up and running within minutes and dramatically improve your online experiences of your users. This is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm talking with Kevin Scott. He's the CTO of Microsoft. And just for um, full disclosure, I happen to work for Microsoft. So you're probably my boss in some way, five or six up. I'm not sure how it works. <laughs> I'm not sure how it works either. So um, I was uh, talking to you before we started recording here, and I did not realize that you were remote too. I'm remote in Portland. Yes, I am. I, uh, I live in Los Gatos uh, and tend to spend a couple of days a week uh, up in Redmond. Oh, wow. A couple of days a week. So yeah. that is, you're, you're commuting more aggressively than I am. Yeah. Has that been a problem? Uh, you know, I will, in all honesty, say that it's not my favorite thing in the world. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm I'm sort of a homebody. I've got um, you know, wife and two little kids, seven and nine years old, mm-hmm. and uh, like my preference would to be at home, but you know, I'm I've sort of been shocked that uh, I've been able to do as much of this job as uh, I have been able to do remotely. Because, like, even though I'm up here a couple of days a week, that still means that three days a week I'm in Los Gatos and working remotely. Yeah, yeah, it's worked. It's amazing though. Like every time I go up, I'm like, yeah, I could see why they would want me here, and I could see why moving here would be good for the career. And I could see why, you know, people always say, when are you coming up next? Like it's not possible for them to speak to you when you're away. Yeah. Do people give you that? The, are you coming up next soon? I, I get less of that actually uh, all the time. I mean, one of the things that I tried to do and I've, uh, I, I've sort of done this uh, a few times, like not, not where I was like living quite so remotely as this, but uh, like, Back in 2003, when I joined Google, I joined the New York office, which was at the time 10 engineers. And like the center of gravity at the company then was entirely in Mountain View in California. And so I spent a huge amount of time back and forth. But my strategy has always been, uh, you know, do, do a whole bunch of traveling at the beginning of mm-hmm a project or whatever you're doing to sort of establish relationships. And then once, you know, once folks have some degree of uh, relationship with you, the remote stuff gets a whole lot easier. And like, there's way less of this, like, Hey, like, you know, when are you going to be here in person? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely did a lot more traveling early on when I started, once you build the relationships and they remember that you exist and that you're cool, they'll put up with any kind of remote (laughs) things that they need you to do. Yeah, and like technology, I think is making it a lot easier. So, video conferencing tech is better now. Uh, you know, things like Teams uh, like makes makes things better. Um, you know, mobile phones like in a certain way make things better. Um, so it's uh, you know it's, it's interesting like how much easier it is now than like this you know fifteen years ago uh, at Google. Yeah, I was actually. Um in a meeting, I, I said that I was in, I was in a meeting last night, not last night, yesterday afternoon. And I said I was in a cafe. I was in McDonald's because they have really good Wi-Fi. And um, I was using Teams on an iPhone and I could see the screen. It was, it was surprising. And I just had a little bit, a bit of a moment there like, oh, wow, you know, I'm actually in a meeting and they can hear me fine and they can see me fine and I can see their screen on a freaking iPhone. Yeah, it's amazing, right? <laughs> yeah. It was cool that it worked. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the older I get, the more I have those uh, moments where I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm doing this. Like I'm talking to my phone and it's understanding what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, 
or like the phone is listening to the music that's playing in the background in this noisy environment and identifying the song. So I don't even have to do the search to remind myself what it is. It's just nuts, right? That's actually a really good segue because you said you've got little kids. I've got a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old, and I'm starting to notice their expectation for technology is much deeper than like their their grandparents, my parents, who are yep. in their 70s. My kids are profoundly disappointment, disappointed if they can't be like, you know, hey, Google, hey, Alexa, hey, Cortana, what's this song? Or how old is Oprah? Like if they yep. can't get the answer right now, they're mad. Yeah. The way they consume content and media is different as well. So my kids are... So I I think from a computing perspective, they tend to be voice natives and touch natives. Like that's just sort of like the two paradigms that they get. And like they expect, just like you said, everything to be immediately available, including their content. Mm -hmm. And it's like torture for them to watch TV. They just don't get it. Like, why, why do you old people like sit down and like watch something when somebody else decides that it's the right time for you to watch it? And you sit through these like interruptions in your programming, like every few minutes, like, are you insane? Exactly. Exactly. Well, we used to have appointment television and my kids are like, has a new episode of Supergirl arrived yet? I'm like, arrived? Like, was it delivered? Like, where do you think Supergirl comes from? I mean, I mean, but I don't even know what day it's on TV. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is. So the, the historical context that you've got sounds like it's similar to mine. You've been in the business for a long time. Yep. Uh, you're, you're ABD with a PhD in computer science. You worked at LinkedIn on the engineering side. Uh, you're an SVP at LinkedIn for six, six years. Yep. W- were you a dev at some point? Like, were you like, like on the, the line writing code? Yeah, I uh, <laughs> I was actually chatting about this yesterday. So um, I got my computer science degree when I was uh, like in the early 90s. And mm-hmm. uh, the first job that I had after I graduated high school was for this company in Lynchburg, Virginia called uh, Electronic Design and Manufacturing. And uh, it was funny enough, like uh, also a startup. So this guy who knew one of my teachers from high school uh, happened to be starting this company and was looking for a high school kid to come in and help out as they, you know, bootstrap their business. And like a lot of it was like putting together like racks and shelves and equipment and whatnot, because they were literally starting from scratch. And and, like I sort of became uh, like their network administrator and uh you know the the it guy as well as uh um like their programmer because we did um we did uh electronics design consulting work for the industrial controls industry um and so i spent a ton of time like four years part-time while i was in college and then i worked uh worked there for a couple of years after i graduated before i went to grad school um, both writing industrial control systems, mostly in assembly language. And, uh, because my boss and, and like, he's like seriously like one of the most awesome people I've ever met. I learned so much from him, but he was also like one of the cheapest human beings on the planet. And rather than buy new manufacturing equipment, he would go to auction and buy all of this junk that was 20 years old. And, uh, he would, do all of the mechanical rehabilitation of this equipment. And he would like give the controls, the electronic controls parts to me and say, Hey, can you figure out how this thing works and like get it to function again? So it was like, yeah, I was writing assembly language and like figuring out like which wires on the wire wrapped uh, bus on these PDP eights that were controlled in these 1970s era uh, IC insertion robots uh, worked. Oh my goodness. That idea though, that someone was looking for a high school student, like, does that still happen? Like you said you were the IT guy. How can we make more IT guys and gals at that age? It feels like people come out of college with a, with a, with a BS in computer science, but because they weren't there when it started, like maybe you and I were, they didn't have that privilege. They might be missing that low level stuff, right? Because JavaScript is the new yeah. metal. Yeah, right, the metal the metal stops at JavaScript. Maybe they set up their network at home. Yep, but, but they, they missed that unless they went into you know the the, the low level stuff. 
there's so many layers now that didn't exist before. And I wonder if we're doing people a disservice as, you know, as they enter the industry. Yeah. I wonder this all the time too. Um, so one is like, I, I think, you know, we really should be doing a better job trying to get kids at a bunch of different ages involved in, you know, what you and I probably did just as recreation. Like when we, like I started coding uh, when I was 12 years old mm. and you know, it was like coding and like hacking together machines and like building your own PC and, you know, just doing a bunch of tinkering stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it's, and, and it's I, a head start, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's totally a head start. So, you know, my wife and I with our family foundation, and it's mostly my wife who runs the foundation, spend a bunch of time trying to figure out. Uh, and like we're mostly we've started in the Bay Area, which is just our community uh, where we can sort of work face to face with uh, with a bunch of these nonprofits have been trying to fund people who are doing innovative things to sort of get the spark ignited for kids as young as, you know, sort of seven or eight years old in STEM and then to like give them sort of a continuing stream of experiences throughout their childhood and adolescence that reinforces this, uh, you know, sort of sense of wonder. Like, I mean, it really was like this amazing thing for me when I was, uh, when I was a kid, like, I just love doing this stuff. It was, you know, I'm a nerd. Right. Uh, but mm -hmm. like, I, I, you know, raced home from school and like, I, you know, went straight to my computer and it was always, I always had a project. I always had a next thing that I wanted to do, whether it was programming or a mod or, or something or the other. And yeah, I mean, like, I think we have to do a better job, but I mean, this other thing that you were talking about, this notion that the, uh, you know, sort of abstraction boundary, so to speak for kids is higher now. Like, I think it's totally true. And on the one hand, it's like this great blessing, you know, you just sort of think about what power we have, put in the hands of an average developer now, like you've got third party clouds like Azure, you've got like incredibly sophisticated programming tools where there's so much already done for you in the standard libraries and uh, you have open source and like this amazing community of people out there who are just, you know, building an incredible array of tech that you can contribute to and incorporate into your own own work. And like all of that's amazing, but it is a little bit scary that at some level, the abstractions that you're working with on a daily basis to do your job are like very, 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 very far removed from like, oh, there's a, you know, there's a current going through this wire, uh, you know, mm -hmm. on a bus somewhere. Uh, and, you know, I, I worry that I'm starting to sound like an old fart now. Um, but well, this like, I, brings up an interesting question, though, right? Because from a from an inclusion perspective, if we want everyone to be involved in technology, it's important for you and I, as you know, middle aged men, to recognize that not everyone's going to have that experience of running home and playing with their Commodore sixty four when yep. they're nine, right? And it's weird for me to want my twelve year old to do that too, you know. But at the same time, is it okay that he just presses a checkbox in Azure and then he scales his website to a global scale and then has no concept of what actually happened? Yeah, I mean, I I don't actually think so. I mean, like this is this is the old uh, old geek in me. Like I think there's, I, I think for all of us, and like this is uh, <laughs> you know this is probably traveling like way far afield uh, from a like tech conversation, but like I think everyone should have, you know, like a, some degree of inquisitiveness and demand that they like at least have the ability to go all the way down to the metal if they want to or need to. Mm. You know, and so like that's true whether it's like, you know, you're consuming media and like you don't know whether it's fake news or not. It's also true if you're like an Azure developer and like the truth of the matter is, is like if you're building any sort of uh, you know, sort of website at scale, even if you've got all of this amazing infrastructure at some point, like it is going to be like a massively complex system and, and at scale, like statistically speaking, like all of the things that could happen are going to happen and somebody's going to need to figure out what's going wrong. And, right. you know, like, well, what you're saying is abstractions leak, 
but they do. But I could I could play devil's devil's advocate a little bit, even though the devil doesn't need an advocate. Uh, what if I go? What if I decide to go and buy a uh, like a Nissan Leaf or a small electric car? But now I've spent all this time learning how a clutch works on and a stick shift. Yeah. Like at what point are we? It's not just layers on top of layers. It's completely changing the paradigm. Yeah. I mean, like the truth of the matter is, like in modern society, like uh, things are so complex that uh, there are very few Renaissance people uh, mm-hmm. in the sense that, you know, one individual understands everything. Yeah. But like, you know, I think, you know, something along the lines of the open source ethos of ethos of like at least having the knowledge out there and having the ability to like push past these abstraction boundaries if you need to. I think it's actually an important mm. thing. I think the point you said, if you need to, right? Like if it's yeah. a black, if it's black boxes on top of black boxes all the way down, then that presents a problem. It does. But if, you, if you can go pretty far down, then that'd be, that'd be exciting. Yeah. And, you know, like, and we have, we have things today like YouTube, you know, like I'm a, I'm sort of a OCD hobbyist and I bought my first 3d printer Two weeks ago. Oh, dude, we could do a whole show on that. I'd love to talk to you about that. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, I never had one before, but, and the reason I bought it is because uh, I'm a woodworker and mm-hmm. I had this thing that I wanted to do in my wood shop where, like, the part literally didn't exist. And rather mm-hmm. than go pay someone to design the part for me and to have it fabricated, like, I went and grabbed a copy of Fusion 360, which I've been meaning to learn for a long while. And mm-hmm. I bought a 3D printer and I designed the part myself. And I learned Fusion 360 like while I was on vacation in uh, in Hawaii. Uh, my kids were on spring break. This is how dad vacations. And mm-hmm. uh, I learned how to use it by watching like a ton of YouTube videos. It's like amazing. It's like the Matrix. It's like you just sort of load this crap into your brain and then go. Yeah, it's it's definitely slow, but it is, it is almost exactly like yeah. When when Trinity wants to learn how to do a helicopter, it takes her a couple of seconds. It takes us a couple of YouTube videos, but I'm yeah totally sure I could fly a helicopter. But like, but, but if it like compare that to when we were teenagers, it's like no internet, no. I mean, this is the thing. So I'm trying to teach my children patience because patience for me was posting something on CompuServe and waiting two weeks. Yeah, maybe getting response. I guess patience on the internet now is posting something on Stack Overflow and then returning to it two weeks later to find your own question, and you're yeah. all alone and no one, no one cares. But it's it's it, you know I, it's again it's sort of crazy. Like when no matter how obscure the thing is, like if you if you type it into uh, into the internet and there's no answer, you're shocked. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> The, 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 this, the loneliest thing on the internet is searching for something and finding yourself alone asking about that question because then you know that you have to go and dig in now, right? And figure it out. Yep. But, th- but then our responsibility as members of the internet, I would propose, is to then put the answer out there. Like, yes. That's where having a blog, owning your own domain is another thing I want to get into my kids' heads. Yeah. And, and not just putting the answer out there, but like being – rigorous and ethical and, you know, sort of committed to like doing your honest best to, you know, this is as good as I can do to like represent a solution to this problem. And here's how I work through it. And here are my sources and, you know, like trying to, you know, again, like follow as much of the scientific method as humanly possible so that if someone comes upon your answer they both have the assurance that like you've gone through this rigorous process, but they also can like follow what you did uh, if they like need to reproduce it. Yeah, exactly. And that requires not only an awareness of ethics, and I'm glad that you said that word, but also an empathy for this individual or individuals who are going to visit your page that you can't see that you don't even, you have to put yourself in the mind of someone overseas who has bumped into your page and yep. they're looking for your solution. Yep. Mm, that's tough. Bridging that world is, is, a, is an ongoing challenge as a, as a parent. Hey, this is Scott. Just a quick moment to thank our sponsors because they make this show possible. Are you looking to build real-time contact data validation and enrichment into your application? Try Melissa's developer portal. You'll gain easy access to flexible APIs for global address verification, phone, IP address, email, and property and business data. 
sample code, and get post methods, plus great technical documentation are all included. Quick online payment makes rapid application development easy. Visit melissa.com slash developer or call 1-800-MELISSA. That's M-E-L-I-S-S-A. That actually, that theme of about being a bridge is one of the things that I wanted to ask you about because uh, I, I have been a, a chief architect at a publicly traded company where my boss was the CTO. And we, he and I were constantly kind of going back and forth about what my job was as chief architect and what his job was as CTO. What do you see the job as a CTO versus you were the vice president of engineering at LinkedIn, which is very hands on, right? Yeah. You know, I, I think that struggle is actually typical um, because, like, I don't know that there is one definition of CTO. Like, I, I always resist it. Like, I, folks, like, wanted to call me the CTO at LinkedIn uh, and in my startup, uh, AdMob. And I resisted that title at both places because, in my mind, there was a clear distinction between a VP of engineering who had operational responsibility. Like, you had code to build and engineers careers to you know nurture and you know make sure that they were doing okay and getting what they needed and like you had dates and you know you were responsible for availability and latency and like all of these you know sort of operational metrics uh and in my mind like a cto was always someone who was uh you know not necessarily um completely disinterested in those sorts of operational things, but their responsibility was just a different time horizon. You know, that's a, that's a little bit of what attracted me to this job. So when Satya and I were talking about it a year and a half ago, I guess was like when we were, uh, we were beginning to have the conversation about what I was going to do next after, uh, after being uh, head of engineering and operations at LinkedIn for six years, uh, he had two problems that he was looking for help with. So one was like the horizontal technology roadmap at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like basically the way that Microsoft runs is like, we've got, we have technical people who are running, uh, running our division. So, you know, Scott Guthrie is, you know, running cloud and enterprise and, uh, like this big group of folks that like now even includes the, like the windows, uh, the windows kernel, and Rajesh Jha is running like all of our experiences stuff. So Office 365 and our Surface hardware division and like basically all of the stuff that sort of has a has a customer, uh, you know, sort of a consumer and customer interface. And like those are gigantic jobs. I mean, like truly epically, epically mm -hmm. big jobs. And so part of, uh, you know, like what Satya was observing is like when you sit around his staff meeting, like he was the only person, only technical person, like only person with an engineering background on his team who was uh, like actively trying to connect dots between those two organizations, like in terms of tech stuff. And like he just, you know, he's also CEO of the company, so he didn't have enough bandwidth to like do that at the, you know, sort of proper scale that it needs to be done at. And like, you know, the other thing too is like, you know, everybody, like my, my colleagues who are like awesome are running like super big businesses where the operational demands are like, just like, they're, they're really intense. Like they, you know, just like you think about how many people and how much revenue and like what the expectations are. Like the whole team like needs like a little bit of an assist with like what's the longer out technology roadmap for the company? Like what do we think we want to be in five years, for instance? Mm -hmm. and, and so like that's uh, that's sort of my job. Like I have a team of people here at Microsoft uh, who are really fantastic who help connect those dots across uh, across team and organizational boundaries. Um, you know, and a lot of that work over the past year has been in artificial intelligence where, you know, you've got this technology that is becoming increasingly important to like absolutely everything you do from, you know, like managing resource utilization and mm -hmm. cloud infrastructure all the way to like how you build the next feature in Excel and like making sure that we're connecting all of those dots in, uh, you know, in like a really robust way uh, is key to, you know, our future success. 
when we as uh, as consumers, not as as techies, and you know, I don't have any inside baseball here, but as a consumer, I've got all these new these voice things in my house now, right? I can yep. talk, I can yell at Cortana and she's right there listening. I can see her on my computer. I can turn to my right and I've got an Alexa. Um, if I had a Google phone, I could ask Google. Yep. And what, what my kids all believe is that that's artificial intelligence. And they don't think it's very smart because, for example, they might be watching YouTube, like you mentioned before. Yep. And that they want to say, hey, Cortana, who's that? Yeah. And that's where it falls down. Or, you know, Alexa, we literally just talked about this like two seconds ago, and now you're confused. So then the, 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 the non-technical partner is fairly unimpressed. I would have to say my non-technical partner is unimpressed. And yeah. she's like, oh, if this is artificial intelligence, I don't know why Elon Musk says it's going to kill us all because it's just <laughs> stupid. <laughs> yeah. Now, look, I, I think your non-technical partner is right. Uh, so... <laughs> You know, for, for like I've like I I've been building machine learning systems since 2004 at Google, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, like a- anybody who has like a degree in computer science, uh, you know, especially our age, uh, you know, just sort of remembers what uh, you know what AI was like in the you know in the 90s and like how it's evolved. And so, like you know, I think the the thing that really excites computer scientists and technologists is when you have problems where the data scale is uh, just unbelievably high and with the ability to like use, you know, silicon like GPUs where you've got like this particular flavor of compute power that's very amenable to solving like a particular type of optimization problem that you need to, uh, like do parameter fitting for deep neural networks. We made just like an incredible amount of progress over the past, uh, you know, six or seven years. And the places where like stuff is really is legitimately sp- smart is perception. So recognizing speech, labeling objects and images uh, like is really good now. Um, and, you know, like we've also gotten good at playing uh like particular flavors of uh you know games with like some degree of strategy involved in them so like go and chess and dota and ms pac-man but yeah i mean like in in the limit like we have a long way to go before we have either single systems or confederations of uh machine learning systems that uh live up to the human expectation of intelligence yeah, I, I I did not work in AI in the '90s, so I don't have that historical kind of feeling. Like I do around the web, I, like I know I can look at a, a modern browser and and go, wow, this is so much better than Netscape Navigator, right? Like I can feel that in yeah. my gut, and I, I have like an NVIDIA GPU, and I can say this is so much better than a 3DFX or a Hercules monochrome card. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, do people, do you working in, like you said, you worked on this at Google many years ago. Do you have that same feeling where I can go, yeah, remember Doom, remember Quake? Now look at the Xbox One X. See how much better that is? Do well, you feel that in your chest around AI? Yeah, I I, I do. Um, you know, and like, look, I, I chose not to specialize in AI when I was in grad school. Uh, yeah. And like, this is <laughs> this, like, I, I, I what I'm about to say will like people be like, Oh, you made a weird choice. So like I, I was, I looked at AI then and I'm like, Oh God, this is like awful. Like most of the people who were doing it were, <laughs> and no offense to those people were doing, uh, uh, you know, sort of like robot task planning and, you know, mm-hmm. well, that's yeah. what, that was the state of the art though. Yeah. Yeah. It was the state of the art. Uh, and so like I chose to be a compiler guy, like <laughs> God almighty, like that's, uh, uh, <laughs> another whole can of dorkery. Um, but I, um, you know, like I, the, the sort of assignment that I got when, after I was at Google for just a, just a few months was like, we had a practical problem that we needed solved with, uh, with machine learning. And it wasn't very sophisticated machine learning at the time, but uh, we were able to do a, yeah, what I thought was like a really amazing job solving the problem, mostly because we had a ridiculous amount of data to use to build these statistical models. 
the the amount of data that we were training on back then and like what the statistical models could do uh are just nothing in comparison mm-hmm. to what uh, what we're doing now. I mean, it's, it's funny. It's funny how the word order of magnitude, like you, the older you get, the more you realize what an order of magnitude really means. And then yeah. you have a couple orders of magnitude, you know? Yeah. And this is probably like in 14, 15 years, probably five orders of magnitude, maybe. Yeah. So like I can do more sophisticated things on, you know, these two Titan X video cards I've got in a, you know, Alienware Aurora machine sitting under my desk at home that I could do on a cluster of a thousand machines. At, at oh, I don't think it, not everyone has a desk like that, but I appreciate it. <laughs> but um, someone actually online, I think it was someone at Stack Overflow said something along the line. And I'm paraphrasing very broadly, but it was like, oh, a terabyte. Your big data is a terabyte. That's adorable. <laughs> we store that in RAM. <laughs> Yeah, right. And like, and, and somebody's going to think that's adorable, uh, like 15 minutes from now, right? I mean, because like, yeah, well, yeah, so like, yeah, like RAM is the new SSD, SSD is the new, you know, tape drive. The, and, the, you know, the really the interesting trend line here, like there, there are two that are sort of driving all of this innovation. Like one is like the explosion of data. And like, if you think data is big now, it's like going to be nothing compared to where it's at in a few years. Like, so the, 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 shocking thing that will be happening is, you know, Gartner predicts that we're going to have 20 billion ish IOT devices connected to the internet by 2020. Um, And like, and and like, you know, some people think that, you know, we're going to like start seeing, you know, eight, nine billion devices a year coming online. And like all of those things are like benefiting from Moore's law and like all of this, like, you know, the, the fact that, uh, GPU like technology that, uh, you know, sort of started off as like a gaming thing that then migrated into the cloud to train machine learning models that, you know, now all of us are working on, uh, you know, sort of silicon to like make that go even faster is going to like be available for cheap, um, you know, in all of these IOT devices and like all of those things, like their, their point in the world, like the reason that they will exist is to like have sensors on them and to gather data about the world. Like think about a, a like a self-driving car, for instance. Uh, yeah. Th- these things are moving terabytes of data a second around from LIDAR and vision systems and whatnot. And like the car itself looks like a little data center on wheels. Uh, and, and like, this is, just 2018. Like, imagine <laughs> what the world's going to look like 10 years from now. Oh, my goodness. I, I just, I don't feel comfortable rebooting my light bulb. Like, I don't feel my <laughs> light bulb the full stack, you know? I recently <laughs> put in a smart switch. Someone's like, what kind of light bulbs did you get? And I was like, yeah, I think a switch is fine. I would like my house to be even dumber than that. Like, I'd like to centralize yeah. the smart. I don't want to boot up Windows on a light bulb yeah. any more than I want it on a switch. I want it in some smart hub. Yeah, you know, and, wiring of my house should be smart, not the switch or the light bulb. Yeah, but I think, you know, like back to what your kids are experiencing. So, mm-hmm. like we have set this expectation with them that you talk to your technology and that it understands <laughs> yeah. what you're saying to it and is able to respond, which means that like everything's going to have to have smarts built into it. Yeah. Like that's just what they're going to expect and like they will I mean, this is the amazing thing about human beings, right? Like we, like a whole bunch of us, like watch Star Trek and Star Wars when we were little kids and like, you know, saw all of this crap and like, you know, we were like, yeah, this is the way it should be. And like we spent our entire lives like trying to manifest it. That's that what our is, kids are going to go do. That is like the, <laughs> you said a lot of cool stuff, but that's like, that's like the deepest thing you said so far, because that's really what happened, right? Like all of these tablets. Yeah. You know, Captain, Mac- Captain Picard. We had it first, you know, talking to the computer, Scotty picking up the uh, the Apple mouse in Star Trek Four computer, you know, like that's what we're trying to build. And we've been trying to build this for 50, 60 years. And, and yep. we won't be satisfied until we get it done. We, we will not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last thing I want to ask you, I hear that you're starting a monthly podcast. So you're jumping into the game. I am. Uh, and, and and like I. I Hope to learn from, uh, from folks like you. Uh, the thing, the thing that, you know, that I want to be doing with my podcast is, um, 
I want to celebrate some of the unsung heroes that are behind the tech that we all use every day. And like one of my uh, one of my first guests is uh, going to be this guy who uh, who invented uh, Turbo Pascal. Like, do you did you use Turbo Pascal when you were a teenager? Uh, when I was a, a full grown adult, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so like, yeah, I. I I was sort of reflecting on this uh, like a little bit. Like, I don't know whether I would have had a career in technology if it weren't for Turbo Pascal. So I I learned to code on a Tandy Color Computer 2 uh, when I was 12, programming in BASIC and then, you know, like some flavors of assembly language like 6502 and Z80 assembly. And uh, like when I, I went to this science and technology magnet school when I was a senior in high school. Like I was lucky enough to like, I I went to this rural like school in the middle of nowhere and like two kids, uh, two kids from our school uh, got to go to this, uh, this thing. And so like, I was lucky enough to be one of the two kids and uh, I took uh, like a real computer science course for the first time there. And we programmed in Turbo Pascal 5.5 which was, I think, the point where they introduced Object Pascal. And it was like, oh, my God, like, this is amazing. Like, th- this isn't hacking. This is programming. Like, this is, like, you can build real software. Like, you know. sure. yeah. So are, you, are you interviewing Philippe Kahn or Anders Heilsberg? Anders Heilsberg. Uh, oh, wow. Look at that. See, I worked on Delphi as well. Oh, wow. That's I've got, awesome. I've, yeah. I've, I used to do Delphi, and I would drop into inline assembler. Because sometimes you just need inline assembly. So, sometimes you did. I mean, like the screen <laughs> buffers were slow, man. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. And you know, even now, thinking about Pascal generally, free Pascal on free at freepascal.org is an open source compiler for both Pascal and and Open Pascal. And it, you could write Pascal on like a Nintendo Wii. Yeah, they can compile it to a Game Boy. You know, Win Win CE OS two. I, I mean, C is portable, but free Pascal. Is That's not, I will have to go check that out. Yes, and, definitely. And so, you know, like the idea is like, let's talk to some of these folks who may be people outside of the industry or, or like maybe only the deep siders inside of the industry even know about who did things that touched an entire generation of programmers and like understand, you know, some of the like interesting things about their experience creating these things. Mm hmm. What is the name of the show and how do we find it? It's uh, going to be called Behind the Tech, and uh, you'll be able to find it wherever you find uh, podcasts. So uh, everywhere. Everywhere. The uh, iTunes store, Spotify, Google Play, uh, or wherever it is that kids go these days. <laughs> Very cool. When, when can we go and check that out? In the next couple of months? Uh, next couple of months. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Kevin Scott, for chatting with me today. Thank you. It's been great. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. 